You're listening to the American Girl Podcast Network. Hi, I'm Maggie Lawson, the narrator of 10 Minute Mysteries. This season's story is based on one of our favorite American Girl mystery books, The Light in the Cellar, a Molly Mystery by Sarah Bucky. Episode two, Where's the Sugar? The next day after school, Molly and Emily biked to the Red Cross headquarters in Jefferson. Emily kept up with Molly and didn't fall once. I guess the practice paid off, thought Molly, as the girls parked their bikes in front of the Red Cross building. Molly was surprised to see her mother drive up in her family's car. Her mother worked at the Red Cross as a volunteer, but because of wartime gas rationing, she usually rode to work with her carpool. Mrs. McIntyre stepped out of the car in her crisp Red Cross uniform. Hello, girls. Are you headed to Oak Knoll this afternoon? Yep. We're picking up magazines to bring to the patients, said Molly. Where's the rest of the carpool? I had to pick up supplies at Bartle's Grocery, so I drove myself, said Mrs. McIntyre, opening the trunk and lifting out a box. Would you like us to help you carry those cottons? Asked Emily, who was always polite. What's in them? Asked Molly who was always curious about anything to do with the war effort. Thank you. I could use some help. This is oatmeal. I need to take it to the storeroom. Molly and Emily picked up a carton and followed Mrs. McIntyre inside the building and down a short flight of stairs. Woof, this box is heavy. Why does the Red Cross need so much oatmeal? Asked Molly, as she and Emily followed her mother down a hallway in the basement. Because our troops love oatmeal cookies. And now we'll be able to make plenty of them for the Glennings Canteen on Saturday. The Glennings Canteen? What's that? Emily asked. And Molly explained that Glennings was a town near Jefferson with a busy train station. The Red Cross sets up a canteen, a sort of refreshment stand, at the train station for the soldiers passing through on their way to fight overseas. Different towns bring different kinds of food. Some bring sandwiches or snacks. Jefferson always brings cookies. Right, Mom? Yes. It's a tradition. Our volunteer bakers make hundreds of batches of cookies. It's our way of thanking the soldiers who are sacrificing so much for us, said Mrs. McIntyre, as she unlocked the door to the storeroom and turned on the light. It was a small, windowless room lit by a single bulb hanging from the ceiling. Shelves held neatly organized cans, jars, and sacks of food supplies. Mrs. McIntyre said, let's put the oatmeal back here. On the shelf below the sugar. Where's the sugar? Asked Molly, looking around the dimly lit room. Here. Well, it should have been right here. Molly's mother knelt down and reached into the deep shelves in the far corner. She pulled a sack of sugar from the back. That's strange. Just last week, we had eight 10-pound sacks of sugar here. I counted them myself to be sure we'd have plenty for the canteen. Now there's only one left. Perhaps the others were moved, Emily suggested. Maybe, but we always store our sugar in the same place. I was counting on it for all our baking for the canteen. I suppose it must have been misplaced, said Mrs. McIntyre. Mrs. McIntyre turned to Molly and Emily. Thanks for your help, girls. You'd better get your magazines from Mrs. Fitzgerald. Good luck at the hospital, and please say hello to your aunt for me, Emily. Molly led Emily back up the stairs to the main desk, where a woman with red hair and a bun was answering questions and assigning volunteers to their work areas. Molly and Emily had to wait their turn. As they stood in line, Molly kept thinking about the sugar. Gosh, that's an awful lot of sugar to be missing. I wonder, do you think someone stole it? When I lived in London, I heard of people getting arrested for stealing rationed foods and selling them on the black market. My teacher said that committing a crime like that during wartime is like helping the enemy. There's a black market in America, too, said Molly. The first time I heard about it, I thought it was a grocery store that was painted black. (laughs) Then my sister Jill explained that black market means buying and selling things illegally. She says it's mostly in big cities, but it can happen anywhere. Molly glanced around the crowded Red Cross headquarters. Many of the faces were familiar, and she knew that all the volunteers were working hard to help America win the war. Nobody here would steal sugar for the black market, Molly told herself. That would be like helping the enemy. Next, called Mrs. Fitzgerald. 
Molly and Emily stepped up to the desk and explained that they were supposed to deliver magazines to Oaknall. Mrs. Fitzgerald reached under her desk and pulled up two stacks of used magazines tied with twine. She said, Here you are. When you get to the hospital, ask for Mr. Pritchard, the director. He'll tell you what to do. Molly and Emily carried the bundled magazines outside, put them in their bike baskets, and began pedaling to Oak Knoll Convalescent Hospital. As they rode along, they passed patriotic posters tacked up outside the Jefferson Town Hall. One poster showed a woman in an apron, making the home front pledge. I pay legal prices and accept no ration goods without giving up ration stamps. Molly thought again about the missing sugar. Would anyone here in Jefferson really steal supplies that we need for our soldiers? She wondered. When the girls reached Oak Knoll Hospital, they parked their bikes, picked up their magazines, and headed down the front path to the main entrance. Inside, a thin woman in a gray dress and white apron was mopping the lobby, which smelled like bleach. Molly asked, Excuse me, could you tell us where to find Mr. Pritchard? That way, past two doors, office on the right. Thank you, said Emily, as she and Molly made their way down the hallway and knocked on the third door on the right. A tall man with thick black eyebrows opened the door. You must be the girl sent to deliver magazines. I saw your bicycles in front of the building. Don't leave them there again. You may put them in the back by the delivery entrance. And be sure to wipe your shoes before coming inside. Remember, this is a hospital. It must be kept clean and quiet. Don't talk loudly or disturb sleeping patients. And do not get in the way of the staff. Molly thought to herself, it seems like he doesn't even want us here. Excuse me, sir. My Aunt Primrose is a patient in room 303. May I visit her? Very well, young lady. You may take your magazines to the third floor. Mr. Pritchard turned to Molly. And you may take yours to the second floor, patients. Remember, no loud noises. Molly and Emily climbed the carpeted stairs together. As Emily continued up the stairs, Molly stepped into the hallway on the second floor. A nurse came out of the nearest room and asked, Can I help you? I'm here to bring magazines to the patients. Well, Mrs. Courier is the only patient in room 201, and she's asleep. Try another room. Molly nodded and knocked on the door of room 202. Come in. To Molly's relief, both of the older ladies in the room were awake and eager to select magazines. Thank you, my dear. I haven't had anything new to read in ages, said one patient, as she selected an old Saturday evening post. Most of the patients in the other rooms were elderly, too. But in room 214, the last room on the floor, the patient was a young boy. Molly thought he looked about eight. He was lying in bed, and his entire body was encased in a plaster cast that started at his neck. Molly couldn't help wondering what had happened to him. When she came in, he could barely turn his head to her to ask, Who are you? I'm Molly McIntyre. Would you, uh, like a magazine to read? The boy looked at his arms, held rigidly in place by the cast. How can I read a magazine if I can't hold it? He said. Embarrassed, Molly shrugged and turned to go. Wait, do you have a National Geographic? My mother could read it to me this evening when she comes to visit. I'm training to be a spy, so I need to know all about geography. The boy looked so serious that Molly tried not to smile. She looked through her magazines and said, No National Geographics today. I'm sorry. I'll save one for you next time. When are you coming back? The boy asked. On Thursday. I'll bring it then, Molly promised. Quietly, she shut his door and headed to the sitting area by the stairs to wait for Emily. As she sat down, she thought to herself, I wonder what kind of people Emily got to meet up on the third floor. Who do you think stole the sugar from the storeroom and what for? Listen to next week's episode to find out who else is suspiciously missing supplies. Thank you so much for listening to 10 Minute Mysteries. And parents, don't forget to write us a review wherever you are listening. It really helps us out. Parents can watch 10 Minute Mysteries with their family on YouTube or your child can watch on YouTube Kids. 